Ah, well, you know, um, how did I end up here at the Institute for Advanced Study at the University of Minnesota? Well, it all started last May. I was um, invited to participate in a couple of concerts which were put on by the Institute um, and Anne and the group Sakabuche. And uh, it went really well. It was a fantastic few days. You know, we all enjoyed each other's company a lot. And uh, yeah, good music making, really good music making. And at the party after the last show, uh, um, we were all chatting. And I said, oh, I love this place. This is fantastic. You know, and, uh, um, Anne and Susan then turned around and said, you know, uh, they said, oh, you should come here come here for a semester. So I thought about it and uh, thought, well, what could I do? What sort of things could I work on? Um, and how much time I could, you know, give to being here. Um, I have quite a busy, you know, concert schedule and recording schedule. And um, so after a couple of months, you know, I sort of talked to various people, talking to Anne, talking to um, uh uh, Nels Klein, um, he's an amazing guitarist and composer from the band Wilco, we sort of came up with this concept of um, the call. Um, and this, this project is um, music coupled with poetry and dance. And uh, we sort of like this idea, Anne has done several projects using poetry, um, and we sort of put together a list of people we thought, you know, it would be nice to sort of approach to be involved in this and to create uh, the call, which is essentially different types of calls, the responses to those calls, um, our reaction to being called, and the whole process of, you know, what we go through when, you know, the calling happens and how we, we absorb everything associated with it. And so that was the idea, but that is the idea. So um, we said, okay, we have a semester. I can be there seven or eight times during that semester. Um, what's our end game? What do we want to achieve? And um, so we came up with the idea, we want to do a concert, a performance um, with these different elements, music, poetry, and dance uh, at the end of 2016, both in um, here in uh, the Twin Cities, and also in in New York. Um, so that's that's the goal. And so we for this semester, um, we've been working on um, formulating a plan, trying to sort of get some chapters together, and to to get all the you know all the different elements of music, dance, and poetry together. Now, um, rather than going in and saying right. This is a sheet we have, you know, like a call to remembrance, call to prayer, call to this, call to that, um, which I would, I like to be quite structured in a way. And uh, so um, we decided not to go that route, but to sort of have this big old pot and say, okay, who's got an idea? Let's get all these ideas of the different calls and responses together, throw them into the pot and, you know, see what comes out. And... Uh, so that's been the process, really. This semester has been trying to find different people and different ideas about different types of calls um, and responses. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it's been, it's, we've been quite successful. It's, you know, in this, in this planning stage, um, uh, we have quite a few composers. Um, we have a local chap called Gary Rushman, um, who was in the group Cantus, um, Tarek O'Regan, um, Gregory Spears, uh, Trevor Weston, um, also improvisations and, you know, composing by myself and Nels Klein, uh, the guitarist, uh, Glenn Kochi from the band Worker 2, the drummer, uh, and we'll have plenty more. Anyway, we'll talk about those later. There's uh, lots of different 
things. I and mean, then we thought about doing different chapters as well, you know, different ways of seeing different types of calls. So, you know, one idea um, was to write a sort of state song um, uh, for Minnesota um, describing a type of call. And um, we have Michael Dennis Brown, who's fantastic, you know, lyricist, librettist, um, who's going to be writing the lyrics to that. Um, another chapter we thought about was like leaving tracks all about um, different type of nature calls. I, I go to um, White Earth Lake each summer and uh, I'm awoken by the, the loon calls, which I, I love. I even found out that there, there's a, a loon call competition here in the Twin Cities where you know people compete to make the best loon call, which I would love to attend. I just got to find out when it is. Um, leaving tracks, different sort of migrations, circles of life, um, renewing the legacy, renewing different legacies as we lose people in our lives, the circle of life, what do we absorb from those experiences when we do lose people in our lives um, as they leave tracks and what we take with us as we move on. Um, so different examples. Uh, another one would be um, one of the main, one of the wonderful things which I love about the Institute and what really attracted me to being part of um, this uh, is, you know, just the degree of cross-pollinization, interdisciplinary cross-pollinization, you know, the way everybody meets on Tuesdays, we have the, you know, the Thursday events too. And I just met some really amazing people um, and uh, through Anne and, uh, and from the other people who are on the Institute. So I just had a, a great time. And one, one fellow is Leslie Morris. And um, while she was here at the semester, she was um, in the process of writing this epic poem about her experiences um, when she went into a coma for six and a half weeks. And uh, it's quite a fascinating tale. I won't tell you all about it now because that will be for her to do. But um, each day the doctor would, you know, go past and write notes on the sheet. And she remembers this one particular phrase which he wrote at the bottom of the doctor's sheet or pad. And it was, she did not speak. Um, so she's going to write this poem called She Did Not Speak, exploring... I'm calling it a call to consciousness or for consciousness. It's a work in progress. We'll see what, you know, what happens. But as she describes her memories, you know, or not mem non-memories or colours and hues in that state of sort of, you know, it being in a coma. So, well, that's one, one uh, another sort of idea. Um, there are plenty more. Um, but anyway, over to Anne. <laughs> can I can I just wait this just hold for a second? Sure. Um, can you can you place this particular project a little bit in your own career? I mean, is this is this the kind of thing you've done before? Uh, so my career then. So what have I done in my career? Well, I have quite quite a diverse career. I started off as a chorister in Bristol Cathedral, um, uh, and uh, sang. Every day apart from Thursday, uh, as, a, as a boy chorister from the age of 10. Um, and then I went off and trained as, well, I did law. Uh, but all the time I was singing. When I was at college, I, I composed jingles to earn money. Um, and then when I was at law school uh, in Chester, I sang in the cathedral choir there. I then went off to Paris to do some um, Christian voluntary work and uh, I was there for a year and I sort of basically decided not to be a lawyer and to actually start a career in singing so I uh, actually got a, had a master class with a chap called Nicholas Clapton who recommended me to his teacher David Mason in London. So I was living in Paris, travelling for lessons to London and then trying to get jobs studying in Paris and so that sort of developed and uh, I ended up working and starting my career there and then I was fortunate enough to 
be able to work throughout Europe, you know, English National Opera, French National Opera, the, you know, well, all kinds of different places. Anyway, and then um, uh, from there, specialising mainly in Baroque music, Baroque music and contemporary music, I sing mainly counter tenor, and I also sing tenor. Um, I came to the States in 2000 and started working there. My first opera was the title role in Handel's Radomisto at uh, Opera Theatre of St. Louis. And so I started then working between America and, and, and Europe. Well, all over the place, really, in Asia. Anyway, so ends up... Um, I started writing songs... Um, and was sort of developing the composition sort of side um, in those first years when I was living, um, you know, between Paris and New York. And I ended up, it took a while, but I ended up writing some pretty good material and uh, I signed with EMI Records, the Blue Note Group, um, to Angel Records. Um, which is my surname, oddly enough. So, Ryland Angel, Angel Records, EMI. And I, I did a self-titled album I, as a singer-songwriter, writing songs, which I co-produced and, and uh, performed and recorded uh, at Abbey Road Studios in London. And so that was my first sort of major composing. Uh, and it sort of got... It was classified as sort of a crossover album, but it... It wasn't really. I mean, most of the most of the album was in Latin, and uh, I sort of wrote a forty-part Agnus Dei. Um, so, but I did do enough uh, generic middle-of-the-road crossover songs to, to you know, get some traction with the album. Um, so, with performances on Good Morning America and other other shows. So, um, that's that was my first sort of you know. Uh, compositions and then I thought well I want to improve it as a songwriter so I, I went off to Sweden which is of course the land of wonderful, wonderful folk singing amazing melody writing just wonderful I, I, I got put in contact with this uh, great uh, songwriter called Emmanuel Olsen and uh, we proceeded to do two albums we, over a period of seven months um, one, a chant album under the name of Sacred Seven, where we sort of, uh, I composed chants um, in sort of a style, sort of in the Gregorian style, but mixed with different sort of like, you know, arrangements, a little bit of electronica as well. Um, and uh, from there, well, actually during that period, um, I used to go into the studio very early in the morning and uh, sort of just play around on the piano and see if I had ideas for the day. And in a nearby studio, in a smaller studio, um, I heard this sort of voice, this sort of amazing sort of voice. And this female vocalist was doing this folk album and she's like, doing this like, <laughs> sort of, sort of, sort of, a bit like, you know, the loon. <laughs> and it was, she did this very, types of call and uh, it was it was wonderful to listen to and that actually is probably the main inspiration for uh, the creation of what we're doing now of the call which was you know when people used to call to each other village to village hilltop to hilltop um, and that's where it all came about that was like the seedling of the idea, and now we've taken it to different dimensions and trying to examine different types of calls and different types of responses. But that was from the time in the time in Sweden. Um, so, uh, what else, composing-wise? Well, I was very fortunate to be given the opportunity to um, write a song. Well, I've sung in several movies, but I've uh, I've actually um, written. A movie soundtrack, which started off with just one song, um, a documentary movie about Dante called Il Mistero di Dante, um, which uh, was a film by uh, Luis and Franco Nero, and uh, with Ethno Abraham, and I composed that soundtrack with uh, Steve Mercurio, 
um, last year, and that's out, got put out by Warner Brothers. So that's quite exciting. Um, well, uh, at, at this point, uh, uh, co-conspirator Ann Waltner might, uh, <laughs> might join us. How did you get involved in this? Well, how, how did I get involved? Um, well, as you know, my, my background is, um, I, I'm a historian, and so the question may be, how did I get involved in um, participating in the creation of, um, of a multimedia choral program? Um, I, met, I met Ryland because we were both performers in um, two performances uh, done by the, the uh, early music group Sakabuche, and my role in those performances was not as a musician, but as a speaker and as the script writer. One of the performances was uh, the map and music of Matteo Ricci, which took as its point of departure a map of the world done in China in Chinese, uh, in 1602 by the Italian Jesuit Matteo Ricci, and that map um, hangs in the James Ford Bell Library here at the University of Minnesota. We premiered that, actually, at the National Center for the Performing Arts in Beijing, and immediately upon returning home, um, and this would have been, I guess, in, in um, December of 2010, I read in the Minneapolis Star Tribune that the Minneapolis Institute of Arts had acquired a map of Venice done in 1500 by Jacopo Barbari, and I immediately emailed Linda Pierce, the director of Sacabuche, and said, do you want to do another map project? And she immediately emailed me back and said, yes. So the second project was a meander through a map of Venice and so when we did these two performances here um, in May, um, was that your first time here? Was that your first time performing with us or did you, were you in Sackville? That was my that first, was the first time. time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, um, we, um, we had heard that, um, that Ryland would be up for a performance that was music and text and instrumental music and, and um, a, a reasonably unconventional way for early musicians to, to perform. And we, we had heard that he would be interested and so we invited him to come and perform with us. And so that's, I mean, that's how I met Ryland, but that's also kind of an introduction um, to, to my career as a performer. It was wonderful. Great times and great shows. Lovely. Um, I'm impressed with meeting creative folks and also academics that uh, they're capable, quite interestingly, of filling all the time there is <laughs> themselves <laughs> and quite willing to do so. And it raises question. I mean, you've you you've all you've both done major stuff that's sold. What is it that draws you to these sort of fairly big scale collaborations, and uh, where, in the nature of things, your piece is just a piece <laughs> of a much larger I, tapestry? I think it's. I, I really enjoy collaborating. Um, getting people who are really good at doing their thing and creating a project that incorporates, you know, several people who have these great talents, I think makes the project really interesting. Uh, so uh, for me, I'm a, you know, I'm a musician, singer, and composer. Um, Anne is a fantastic writer and a great speaker. And for the call, we'll have a dance element, which I'm really excited about. 
and I'll also have you know other composers you know involved, and we're inviting you know a couple of other you know uh, librettists as well. So this the idea with the call as well. It's I want you know as I said before different types of calls, different types of perspective, and we are the gatekeepers in this process when we're assembling all this material. We are um, basically going through different things and seeing what what could work and you know what we like and of the different ideas. But uh, in this case, you know, one plus one equals three. You know, one plus one plus one equals nine. Um, just having a, a show that has these different aspects and uh, displays these different talents. I like working with people who do things that you know I can't really do. Yeah. Yeah, for me, that's actually the key. Is I, I, I like doing things that I can't do. I mean, I like, I like being intimately involved with the production of a musical work. And I am not, I am not a musician. Um, I, you know, I like, I like, you know, I, when when Linda Pierce and I structured both of the shows. Um, actually, we, the, the Venezia program was largely structured one night in Toronto when we were snowbound in a hotel room. And we, you know, and, and just, you know, the, the interplay of the, the structure of the music and the text and the music and the text and the music and the text just, you know, using her brain and my brain together to do it, it was... It was uh, it was simply it was simply thrilling, and so I mean it's a it's a it's a different it's a different kind of pleasure than than working alone. Um, at one point, um, we we did the Ricci program fairly quickly. We um, we agreed to do it in April, and then I guess in September we found out we had the gig at the National Center for the Performing Arts in Beijing. And I had not yet written anything. Um, she had selected music, but I and I was spending a lot of time preparing a major public lecture on the Ricci map to celebrate the acquisition of it. So I kept emailing her saying, "I'm not writing yet, but don't worry, I'm not thinking about anything but Ricci." And we just sort of zoomed and and did it. And at one point. Fairly late in that fall, I kind of thought, well, what on earth makes her think I can do this? And then I thought, what on earth makes me think I can do it? But it, it never occurred really to either one of us to doubt it, that I could. And I actually think that part of my, um, part of my boldness comes from my experience of having for nine years led the Institute for Advanced Study where I was constantly in conversation with people who were doing all kinds of, of creative work. And I think it really did, um, it did expand my imagination and expanded my sense of what was possible. So um, I also collaborate as a historian. I would say maybe a third of the stuff that I've written lately, or maybe maybe more than that, has been done in collaboration with my colleague Mary Jo Maines, who's a European historian. Um, I mean, we we uh, we team teach a course called The Family from 10,000 BC to the Present, which has global scope. We wrote a book for the New Oxford World History series on the family from 10,000 BC to the present. Um, we just finished an article for a book that Antoinette Burton is editing called, the book is called World History from Below, and we wrote an article again with global scope on political revolutions. Um, we have a major project that will be a long-term project because we keep getting these short-term projects, um, looking at transition from girlhood to adulthood, um, in the 18th century and looking at ways in which um, marriage patterns and labor patterns um, have an impact on individual life courses. So 
sort of that's that's the kind of stuff I do in my day job. It, it strikes me as quite a different kind of collaboration than you had before this business with the call. That is, with earlier collaborations, you had a document, a mm -hmm, map, mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. you know somehow or other was going to stitch everything mm -hmm, together. Mm -hmm. Here you have an idea, but kind of an idea that comes in many flavors, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> sort of like the breeds of dogs, I mean, <laughs> as between, you know, from, from cell phone calls to altar calls to the call of the prophet uh -huh. <laughs> uh, to the call in the tower uh, by the, the call to prayer uh, to mom calling your kids in for supper, you've got a kind of I mean, it's it's a it's a unifying fine element, but it seems somehow less graspable in a map. I'm wondering how that's worked for you. Well, um, at the moment, you know, from the time we've spent, we this is the development stage, and uh, what you know, what you just uh, described, you know, having all these different types of calls that are possibilities to write about. Um, obviously we'll be narrowing that down and finding different types of calls that work well together um, which is uh, I described earlier you know uh, a sort of movement or chapter that would be like leaving tracks which will take like animal and nature calls you know the loon from Minnesota for example and then combining that with um, a sort of call of you know renewing the legacy um, as we have these different circles of life, different migration patterns, and how comparing that to, you know, how we cope with uh, death in our lives and loss in our lives, um, and how we absorb, how we absorb that, what we take on from those different experiences, and how we move forward, and how the circle of life moves forward. So. It, you know, these chapters are hopefully going to have, well, hopefully as we go through them, you know, we'll be trying to find different calls that we can compare in each chapter, if that makes any sense, hopefully. <laughs> but I guess another, another way of addressing your answer is we, the stitching isn't finished yet. Um, it's, only, <laughs> it's only just begun. And, and it probably is going to be a more loosely stitched Thing than either than either the Ricci or the Venezia because both of both of those really did did have a physical document that anchored them and I think this this may be a little bit less anchored and um, the unity the unity is an idea um, and. But I think it. I think the the sounds probably in interesting ways will echo and parallel one another. Yeah. Um, absolutely. The, in ways that we don't yet completely know or understand, because That's, we haven't done the work. You see, <laughs> we're the beginning, but it's it's exciting exactly. It's what Anne described. You know, as we discover these parallels as we go forward in the process it's, it's an exciting process that we're you know we're both really enjoying um, as you know as we see these things coming together um, but we are at the beginning so this video has been taken at the beginning the, the, the first stages of this of this project the call I'm honored <laughs> nothing I'd like better than to document this thing through uh, well that'd be lovely <laughs> so has your is, is history sneaking up on you here? I mean, uh, our president is the only president I remember who will be remembered for his eulogies. Yeah. And he just did one which ended in call and response in the old, uh, in the old style. Yeah. Uh, and so has brought both the matter of how people who died leave traces mm -hmm. and how events call out to the next generations and also 
this idea of the leader as someone who calls out and then gets quite literally a response mm -hmm. and is leading in, in that way. I mean, all of these ideas have now gotten, which were in a certain sense off to the side mm -hmm. of consciousness, have now been brought by this historic moment into everybody's uh, field of vision, into the mm -hmm. public world that becomes a kind of teachable moment in a certain mm -hmm. way about calls and this, what this whole, whole metaphor can do. I'm wondering, are you thinking about that sort of thing? About what calls can do, what they can... Well, I'm thinking about what is happening, how what's, what's been happening in history, as you're putting this together, in, in American history especially, uh, how, that, how that might, as it were, be echoed in the kind of art, of art project you end up producing. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, um, I thought what you said was just, just now was really, really, really interesting. Um, and I suspect there will be echoes. I'm not quite sure how. We just um, were meeting with somebody who played us um, a video of a man playing an Ojibwe flute and what he was playing was Amazing Grace with Ojibwe ornamentations. And I was actually thinking as we were hearing it that it might be interesting to quote, not, not the whole thing, but to quote phrases of, of that in, in the performance somehow. That's a good idea. And which, which would, you know, then uh, refer both um, to you know Ojibwa music and I think it'll be a long time before anybody in the US at least hears Amazing Grace without thinking of, of the Obama eulogy. Yeah well the um, Ojibwe element is something that we discussed back at the end of January one of the fellows at the Institute um, is a name called Eric and uh, um, he was really useful and great and uh, gave us some different words and phrases in Ojibwe and sort of we're just, just talking about that and having just different conversations with him and learning more about um, that subject which I, I, you know, I didn't previously know much about, so, um, yes. <laughs> So, that, so you're kind of open to going in many directions, mm -hmm. depending on what gets put into the kettle that you, yeah. you're yeah. playing yeah. out for artists. So how do, you, how do you decide where to send your, your invitations for stuff to put in the kettle? <laughs> um, it's been quite... What's, what's it called when things just sort of happen? In Oh, serendipity? Yeah, that. So it's, uh, it's, you know, I was walking through, you know, I met Anne because I was doing the concert with Sakabuchi. So that was the very first thing. Um, Nels Klein, you know, who's this amazing, you know, improviser on the guitar, I met by knocking on somebody else's door. Um... Michael Dennis Brown, I was introduced to in a museum on campus at some art exhibit. Um, Eric and Leslie were fellows, you know, at the Institute of Art Studies. Um, just serendipity. Uh, the idea of, you know, keeping this big kettle. I prefer kettle to pot, by the way. I love your <laughs> fact you say kettle. Um, just leaving this thing open, you know, just seeing what's going to come along. Um, that's been the main sort of way it's sort of come about. I made some specific calls. Um, uh, we are, you know, here in Minnesota, you know, this is choral capital of America. I mean, everybody sings. And uh, that was one of the things that really attracted me to... Um, you know, creating this call here. 
um, one of the things you know that we want to do is uh, as I said create this uh, Minnesotan song which um, we'll advertise you know six months before the show happens and get the you know the audience to come and sing that song so the audience will in fact be one of the choirs in in the in the performance we hope these are ideas which we hope will come to fruition so um, it was interesting, I, uh, Leslie said, meet Mindy Ratner, you know, at the radio here. So I met Mindy, and, you know, she was great, and she introduced me to the people there who said, yes, let's do a monthly blog of the call, which, you know, once it gets into full swing, we'll start doing this, you know, monthly blog. So serendipity. Mm -hmm. um, I actually sang here um, with the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra with Nicholas McGeegan um, several years ago. We did a program of Purcell and Clark, I think. And um, so Barry Kempton at the time was working at the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra. And now he runs the Schubert Club. And the Schubert Club, I, I met Barry, I reconnected with Barry um, over the last few months. And uh, they have a collection of different instruments, including a collection of conch shells, which immediately made me think, a call to the sea. Now, there have been lots of different calls to the sea, so we haven't yet formulated what that call will actually end up being, but having met Barry and then Philip Blackburn at the American Composers Forum, who I also, I met him at a liquid music function. Uh, we met, uh, I was going to, I was invited by Kate Nordstrom to, to a concert you know, St. Paul Chamber Orchestra Liquid Music Series, uh, New Music, and I saw this guy selling CDs. And it ended up being Philip Blackburn, who actually runs the record label Innova for American Composers Forum. And he was a great, great chap. Um, and he actually wrote a piece for conch shells, using the conch shells mm. of the Schubert Club. So, it's serendipity. So all these things have come about just from really being here and keeping our minds open to things that can happen. Which in itself, I suppose, <laughs> I don't know, is that a call to serendipity? <laughs> I don't know, it's a, uh, you know, whatever it is, um, enough of these things have been happening over the last, you know, few months during, you know, my time as, as a fellow that it sort of points to the fact that this thing has to get done. You know, it's a, an exciting project which, you know, there's some really wonderful elements. Yeah. I'm, I'm just amazed at how much you're simply letting things happen. Uh... I'm pretty amazed too. It's not in my nature, uh, necessarily. I've had to learn as an artist to sometimes you just got to let it, you just got to let it go. You can prepare as much as you prepare, you know, I, I like to prepare a lot, but ultimately, you know, things happen. If you, if you open yourself up to these different things, they will, you know, you never know. It's exciting. Yeah. I remember... Scary, too. Yeah. <laughs> early, early on, and I guess when I say early on, I probably mean January or February. Yeah. I, I asked you how important control was to you. And we sort of had a, a conversation about control and control and letting go. And, and I guess at the end of that conversation, we decided we were the gatekeepers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but until, until the moment or the, the mini moments when, when decisions need to be made, I think it, it is really productive to keep open to possibility um, because, you know, we both have really good imaginations, but they don't hold everything. Yeah. Um, so it's exciting, you know, we're, we've got a lot of people involved here in Minnesota. We have people involved from um, uh, New York too. Um, there's a, a wonderful choreographer who's actually going to be here at the Northrop in October with his dance company. His name's Sean Curran. 
and he's, he's great. And he's, he's uh, uh, offered to be part of this with us and to create some choreography. And what's nice about it, he said, well, let's do it. And we can use some of my dancers, but also let's use, you know, different groups, you know, here in the Twin Cities. So there's, you know, the Minnesota Dance Theatre, there's, you know, Xenon. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's exciting. Um, yeah. And I think we have captured the imagination of a lot of people in the arts departments here on campus. Um, um, and we've had several conversations with people and they, um, when, when things were even more amorphous than they are today, and it's, it's sort of interesting how, um, how easy it is for a concept like the call to capture people's imaginations. Yeah. I mean, even, even though they don't quite know what it is, they can, they can kind of see that, um, that there may well be something substantial there that they want, to, they want to participate in, and that there's room for them to participate. I guess that's one of the things about it. Absolutely. You know, that is so true. You know, we, you know, we met with various people and at the very beginning of the process, and everybody said, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do that, yeah. I'll be part of that, you know. And it's nice, you know, whether it's the anthropology department, music department, opera department, you know, um, uh, you know, art department as well. It's, it's uh, going to be good. And as we go through this process, we'll see how these things gel and who does what. And uh, yeah, it's exciting. It's a process. Yeah, so it's learning, learning to enjoy the process mm -hmm. is something that um, I've had to sort of learn. <laughs> so this is, it makes it even more, I don't know, for me to have an open pot and as we said you know we, we are the gatekeeper gatekeepers of the project but to actually have this sort of open kettle <laughs> um has been uh, yeah it's it's a learning experience for me for sure uh to to let that just let it go you know frozen let it go let it go yeah, yeah. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to figure out how to put these metaphors together. We've got the the gates and gatekeepers and kettles. Yeah, I, yeah. I think, I think it's one of those elements. There's this, this, this medieval thing, which is, you know, sort of a kettle on the bottom, and then there's this, there's this glass thing that comes up off the top of the kettle and distills down. Oh, uh-huh. Uh, I, I, I think it's an Alan Beck. But I never... a, a what? An Alan Beck. An it's Alan the name Beck that comes to mind, but I may be making, confusing things horribly, and I'm not going to look it up because it would be impossible. But the point is, it's so it's it, it's really an alchemical. Yeah, process. yeah, yeah. It's yeah. an alchemical process of putting together a bunch of things that that don't normally go together. You know, I have told. Uh -huh. We don't have know, any of those yet, do we? Uh, oh, yeah. Tale of rats. Yeah. You know, yeah. a little bit of starlight. You put it all in. And yeah. Then somehow or other, someplace there's a. There's then this distillation process. Yeah. Uh, well, what's what's coming to mind as you're talking is the history of opera. Hmm. I mean, it must have been like this, mustn't it? When when opera happened, when it first started, when the idea that theater and art and instrumental music and singing could all could all have a could all could all go together and and make sense together. Yeah. Uh, so there have been these moments when people have, as it were, established kettles. Yeah. I <laughs> suppose the first opera was that. That was Jacobo Perry's Eurydice. I suppose the first official opera. But, you know, there were lots of stuff before that. I mean, one thing I always enjoy doing is performing uh, liturgical plays. Hmm. So... Uh, with the Ensemble of the Body Music of New York, I did the play of Daniel, which was uh, a lot of fun. But, you know, liturgical plays, the monks used to perform these. And, you know, there's Daniel, there's a Marian play. Could be a Herod. But the one I know most about is, is the, the play of Daniel. Yeah. So there must have been a stage before opera came to be, it, it, before the named operas came to be. When people were fooling around with 
elements that normally didn't go together and saying, well, what would it, what would it be like if we had some music under this thing? Or right. what would it be like if, if we painted the scene behind this thing? Or uh, such like. Uh, so there, there are these sort of formative moments. When, 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 new, when new, new forms of art, new forms of expression, new forms of collaboration arise. Mm. Um, well, we're going to be using, as we said, it's music, it's, you know, poetry and dance. So, it's, um, so that in addition, so for us really it's a question of, you know, seeing what calls are going to work together mm. out of the kettle. So that's, you know, that's the sort of place where, you know, there are so many different possibilities, so many different types of causes, you know, as you pointed out earlier, that, you know, we have to figure out, you know, in our process, which ones we want to explore. And, you know, earlier I gave a few examples of things that we, you know, what we're looking at. Um, one thing we will be incorporating into the show, though, is improvisation. Mm. So there'll be certain... Um, movements, uh, whether it's a simple choral piece where I want certain instruments to be improvising during these pieces. Similarly enough, um, if we have, say, Anne or, or Michael decides that you know, they want to read a poem at a certain juncture, that could be without music, it could be with dance, or it could be actually be with a sort of like um, an, an improvisation as well whether on guitars, on keyboard instruments, even on this one instrument um, I've been working with recently called a cristal, which is made by the Bachet family in France um, uh, in the sort of late 50s, 60s, I think they went through a period of developing these sort of like new instruments and one of them was this cristal and this crystal instrument has lots of metal and you know things you can bang. It also has these long strands of like glass which you put water on, and it makes this sort of sound. You know, it's like this amazing sort of thing. And depending on how much pressure you apply to these strands of glass, they make these different types of sounds. And then there are these cones on the front which you know you can scrape, and it sounds like an elephant. Uh, it's it's quite the most amazing instrument. So. I'm now convinced, sort of convinced. We have, actually haven't discussed this yet. Um, <laughs> so I shouldn't say I'm convinced. I think it could be a good idea to explore the possibility of using, you know, new instruments like that, you know, but in a, in a, in a, you know, in a cool way, uh, which, uh, which support, in a supportive way of what's being done, whether it's, say for example, one of the dance companies says, we're going to do this dance, but we're going to do it without music. We're going to have people actually improvising music to that dance. So we're going to have a poem, as I said earlier, we have a poem, they could be improvising around that too, whether it's through instruments, like I said, with like crystal bache, guitars, drums, percussion, um, keyboard instruments, or voices. So... Um, during my career, I've done quite a lot of things, you know, quite a lot of improvising. I mean, the, one of the albums I did, which I think I mentioned earlier, Sacred Seven, this chant album, um, the way I actually did the album was to um, go to the studio, hold down a pedal point, like a G, um, hold it for like five minutes, um, take a Latin text, and I, my father, Father Jervis Angel, um, uh, actually got me a bunch of these great text from the Bible and um, and I just then looked at the text had the pedal point and just improvised the melody and then when the words came to the end that was the end of the song and I could I sort of as I was going along I was thinking should I make this strophic should I not is it just going to be one continuous thing um, so this album Sacred Seven is based on these improvised chants and the most difficult thing about our whole album was if I wanted to simulate a choir of voices, I had to imitate myself each time with all the small inflections. So on that album, there's a couple of tracks with just one voice, and then on several, there's like up to 120 different voices. 
So I had to, I had to sort of, uh, you know, that took some time. And I didn't have other singers. I was in the studio by myself, so it was me singing each time and just uh, multi-tracking. So I'd, I sort of imagined myself uh, being in an abbey or something and, uh, and uh, being these different, you know, like, you know, cook monk, you know, the head prior, the drunken, <laughs> the drunken scoundrel, you know, the gardener. Um, and the image in my head was actually of Dowie Abbey. Um, I've recorded a couple of albums, a Purcell album, uh, Purcell, and, uh, Purcell and Blow, uh, John Blow, and then another album called Tutta Samore, which is Stradella and Scarlatti motets. Um, and I was resident at a place called Dowi Abbey, D-O-U-A, D-O-U-A-I with a couple of dots on it. Um, so yeah, Dowi Abbey, which is actually not in France, but in just outside Reading in England, in the UK. Yeah. yeah. So, um, well, you know, when you're, when you're describing the album, I mean, there's a product that will live on, that potentially mm. continues once it's in, in something like a final form yeah. for as long as recorded music exists. Yeah. Do you imagine that there will be anything comparable coming out of a call? Oh yes. What? What? How do? You, how? How does it? How does it persist in time? This thing you're making. Well, again, we are at the beginning of this process. You know, you are witnessing the beginnings of this yeah. process. Let there be light. Yeah. <laughs> well, big, we open the shades. <laughs> the big kettle. So. Um, We'll be documenting this uh, through a blog uh, with local radio, um, which is very exciting. And uh, as things come together, as things, you know, say if there's a piece of music that's been written, if the dance is going to then try to work on the choreography, we'll, we'll sort of take... Um, in fact, you could do this. It'd be great. You know, document the process of how these things come together. Um, for sure, we'll have um, uh, you know, the final performances, which we hope will be late fall 2016. Um, but again, we have a lot of elements to consider, a lot of writers to consider. Um, you know, we'll, be, we'll be filming and recording that. So that, for sure, will live on. And it'd be great to get sort of... Uh, the process documented too, so we're looking at different ways of doing that. But but then, I mean, I, I thought, I mean, so you, you have a, a presumably a, a reasonably professionally made, uh, you know, sort of video of your of your of let's say your final performance. Will we? Well, well yes. Well, I, hopefully. But if you do that, I mean, is that then the sort of thing that could be like sold on Amazon? <laughs> Is that, or I mean, is that how you're imagining it continuing, or is it the sort of thing that then gets kind of archived, where we find find performances go to die, so to speak? Well, we we haven't really um haven't really discussed that. I mean, it'd be lovely if people could you know watch recordings of it. That'd be great. Um, we'll see how it turns out. You know, there are. You know, other things to consider, different composers who um, are tied to different sort of publishing houses and things. So, you know, we'll see, we'll see how it works. Well, you know, we'll... So whether you could get the rights to actually proceed in that way would be one Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I presume we will, but again, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Yeah. The, so there's that matter. The other matter that I'm curious about is what happens to the stuff that doesn't make it past the gatekeepers? I mean, you've got a bunch of stuff pouring into the kettle by the serendipity gods from all over right now, directing folks to fill your kettle. <laughs> um, some stuff won't fit together with other stuff. Is there any place for the stuff that doesn't fit, for the video equivalent of outtakes? Uh, I think absolutely. Um... At the moment, we haven't got enough material to, and we haven't sat down and, you know, gone through it to see what what's going to work and what's not going to work. Um, but I think for 
for all the things that are happening. Yeah, absolutely. That'll be a. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Think? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's yeah, totally. Because one can certainly imagine ideas of really high quality that we choose not to use because they don't fit. Yeah. I mean, and one can also imagine work that's not of high quality, but um, but I think you know when when we get a clear vision of structure and how we want to do things, there may be there may be things that that just don't yeah. don't work. I mean, I worked on a piece um, uh, recently. I wrote this song. I, I had this lyric called "How Beautiful," which um, uh, this you know great librettist you know wrote this just sort of, you know tiny bit of poem, and I was sort of experimenting with the idea of it. And as I was writing the melody to this thing, which I thought could be an interesting call, I thought, well, it's not really that specific as a call. It's like a love call of sorts. You know, could we have a chapter mm -hmm. which is all about love calls? You know, if we want to have a heading, you know, sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I thought maybe that could work. Um, but the more I, you know, go into that sort of idea, as I'm exploring this melody of it, I'm thinking, well, it sounds like a hymn that, you know, high schools should do. It's like a two and a half minute, you know, piece of music that would be good for like, you know, choral competitions. So maybe it would be good for the choral, I have no idea. But uh, I, uh, there are certain things like that, say, you know, if there's no room for that, you know, if it doesn't fit into certain things, then it's a great thing by itself. It'll be used by, you know, for something else. So, yeah. So, you, so you're... you're Potential performance, the thing is, is sort of like a black hole to get another message. <laughs> well, I wouldn't. That the, sounds pretty. That sounds pretty bleak well, to me, it's actually. It's a sort black of gravity hole. well. It's a sort of. It, it's, it's pulling a, a bunch well. of stuff together. Oh, right. And and the, the striking thing is that it might generate all kinds of material that has other uses and goes off in other directions that starts out as an attempt to answer this particular mm -hmm. call. Yeah. Uh, it would be interesting to see kind of the range of things that come out, but it's a different conception also of what it is to put together a piece. Mm -hmm. When you say, I'm producing a piece that I hope will create all kinds of things we can't use <laughs> that are useful in other ways or that are in some way interesting. Mm -hmm. I think it'd be nice that if people are writing for the project that it sort of works. Um, but again, given the, you know, the, the big old kettle, you know, leaving it open like that, there will be things which probably won't work. Like I said, you know, the thing that, I, that came to mind earlier, the beautiful little song called How Beautiful. Um, if it doesn't, it's a beautiful piece which I've really enjoyed doing, and there'll be uses for it. But if it doesn't work in the in the final concept that we come up with, or the final sort of like you know playlist, then that's you know that's fine. Well, and this this is something else that we haven't discussed, but it may well be that the performance here and the performance in New York will not be identical performances. True, I mean, and we're, workshops. We're, and workshop, I mean, we're probably Prior. not gonna move large numbers of choral singers from Minnesota to New York. Um, I mean, we, we would happily do yes, they're it. they're on a tour, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we, you know, we, the, but, so it seemed, it also seems to me that then this, this is the kind of performance that could, that could be localized. Um, because we are imagining that um, that a big component of it will be choral music, and um, as Ryland indicated, um, trying to get the whole audience singing. Um, so I th I think I mean I think that that when the curtain goes down, the process still won't be over. I think. Um, Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. Well, best of luck. I look forward to the next installment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being part of this.